25 years ago, uh, this experience was started. Um, and I'm trying to remember what I was thinking 25 years ago uh, when I had the opportunity, uh, together with my wife Diana, uh, to introduce Lena to Catherine La Lumière and to contribute uh, to create uh, this story. Well, I was very hopeful then. Uh, the Berlin Wall had fallen three years ago, and uh, I was considering that uh, Russia was about to return to Europe and to join in the democratic adventures, uh, which was uniting the continent at that moment. What an illusion. Uh, but you have to go back to the roots of that illusion, which was based on some geopolitical analysis too. It seemed natural to us that uh, if Germany had been united around the concept of democracy, if Eastern Europe uh, was returning to Europe, why shouldn't Russia go in the same direction? Uh, by the end of the day, uh, Russia was always greatest at the peak of our history when she looked west. That was the uh, choice of Peter the Great. And uh, in geostrategic term, I felt that for demographic reasons, uh, the only threat from to Russia was coming from the East, from the Asian masses, and that the only choice Russia could turn to was to align herself with the West to fight, to face that demographic reality, which is that uh, there are very few Russians in the world, and there are very many, many Asians and in particular Chinese, and that, that process would go on. So if you were to have a little more than 100 million Russians with 500 million Europeans, that was already something significant that could balance the more than 1 billion and 400 million Chinese. It was too simplistic. It was naive, and it was accompanied in our mind by arrogance. I think we were arrogant in the 1990s. We considered that it was only natural that Russia should learn from us, that Russia uh, had lost time and had uh, uh, make herself in prison by ideas that, uh, in fact, contributed to destroy the country. Uh, I was very much impressed by a conversation I had in the garden of the Palace of Versailles with a Soviet Union dignitary. We were walking alone in 1986, and we were discussing the dramas of the 20th century. And he said to me, well, we all suffered a lot. But no country has suffered more than the Soviet Union. And you know, we suffered a lot from World War I, from World War II. No one suffered more. But when you look at the global casualties of this century, the 20th century, more people were killed by Russian than by foreigners in Russia. And this is something 
that will come out at some point. And that story, which was obvious, uh, impressed me a few years before, uh, in 1981, in my first trip to Moscow in June, I was asked to deliver a speech at GIMO, the top school for Soviet diplomats. And uh, that experience struck me a great deal. They invited me because at that time, François Mitterrand had been elected president of the French Republic. And the Soviet Union was quite worried. Uh, it looked surprising, but they were very much at ease with the former president of France, a uh, liberal capitalist, uh, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. And they were scared of this new alliance between communist and socialist. And my goal, strangely enough, was to try to reassure them. Maybe things are not going to change that much. In fact, they did change, and not in favor of the policy of the Soviet Union at that time. But what struck me most is that at some point I said to them, well, you know, the most important thing is that we have changed course. And we did so by popular vote. The Fifth Republic was created by Gaullist, the right, mostly. And uh, for 23 years, they had dominated French politics. And I said very openly, it's good to be able to change course from time to time, peacefully. And I look in the eyes of uh, the crowd, they smiled at me silently. And uh, when the time came for questions, uh, there were very few questions. Uh, they were arranged, pre-arranged, between the teachers and the student. But I came back to my hotel and I wrote a note to the then diplomatic advisor of the French president. And I said to him, I went to Moscow, I was at the seat of Ngimo, and uh, I look at the eyes of my students, and I can tell you my deep impression when I look at them. The regime is condemned. In 10 years, the Soviet Union will no longer exist because the top of the elite no longer believes in it. And I receive a stern, very critical note from the diplomatic advisor of the French president, which I kept preciously. I want from you analysis, not poetry. And of course, 10 years later, the Soviet Union had disappeared, uh, but I was wrong. Uh, because uh, the story did not evolve in the way it could or may, it may have evolved if we had not been so arrogant, because we were arrogant, if we had not been so convinced of the absolute superiority of what we stood for. But the end of the Soviet Union, preceded by the fall of the Berlin Wall, had a major influence in my professional life. I had started teaching international relations as early as 1972, i.e. 46 years ago. I was still 25 and I have been teaching for that very long period of time. And at the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s, I was getting terribly bored. Uh, and I remember giving a long one-page interview to the New York Times, saying, well, maybe what has happened in Berlin will allow me to remain 
in the field of international relations because I'm bored to count missiles and to take additions to compare uh, uh, who's coming first in long-range missiles, in mid-range missiles, the United States and the Soviet, Un or the Soviet Union. Now we are entering a different world, a world where the effect is going to be much more important, a world of complexity, a world of emotion. And this gave me the impulse, the intuition that subjectivity would matter much, much more in understanding international relations. And less than 20 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, I wrote a book which was translated by Lena School into Russian called The Geopolitics of Emotion, how cultures of fear, humiliation, and hope are reshaping the world. And in that book, I was trying to map the emotions of the world, to draw a cartography of the emotions of the world. And my goal was to say, is there a dominating color at a single moment in a particular place in the world? And I chose those three emotions, fear, humiliation, and hope, because they all related to a word which I felt was essential when it came to an understanding of international relations, i.e. confidence. Where was confidence? Where was confidence lacking? And at that time, when I wrote that book in 2008, I saw more fear in the West between the United States and Europe, more humiliation in the Arab Muslim world, and more hope in Asia behind the economic growth of China and India. And in 2018, I think emotions are much more important than they were even in 2008. But they are more complex to analyze. The shades of gray have uh, multiplied, so to speak. In the West, um, the culture of fear has triumphed in Great Britain with the result of Brexit, in the United States with the election of Donald Trump. But in my very own country, France, as everybody was expecting that after Trump, after Brexit and Trump, Marine Le Pen, i.e. the candidate of the far right, should, would win, would be logical, the candidate of hope, the candidate who advocated Europe triumph without any doubt in the clearest manner. And so you have a Western world divided between fear and hope. In the Middle East, you have humiliation. It goes on. But you have also some elements of hope. Fake hope, real hope, I don't know. But in countries like Saudi Arabia, or even smaller country like Qatar, you have a new generation of leader that came to power obsessed with modernity, obsessed with the idea that the system had to adjust to modern times. And in Asia, you can't only speak of hope because there is the fear of war around North Korea, and there is the fear that a mixture of nationalism and religion will uh, 
create as created very tough situation from India with uh, Modi taking power in the name of Hinduism in Myanmar, Burma, where uh, the Muslim minority of the Rohingyas have been persecuted. And so you have in each of these categories variation, fluctuation. Where, what about Russia? Well, in my book, in 2008, I placed Russia together with Iran in the very specific category of country which I called hard cases because there was no single emotion dominating Russia. There was humiliation after the 1990s, the Yeltsin years. There was fear, fear of Islam, fear of the rise of terrorism, fear of decline. But there was also hope and some sense of a return of pride. And I think today the Russian case is as confused as it could have been 10 years ago because those three categories are still present. Russia is using humiliation as a weapon. Russia is fearful of the present and the future. And Russia is full of hope and pride for what it has achieved on the international scene in the last 10 to 20 years. In fact, and I was asked to launch that seminar with a very broad presentation, what we are witnessing is an acceleration of history and a complexification of history taking place at the same time. And to understand that process, you have to link together five key factors. The first one, I would call it the equivalent of a tectonic shift in geopolitical terms. And that tectonic shift is linked to the fact that the West is no longer the center of the world or the unique center of the world. The West has lost its monopoly for models. And here, and this is a very important criteria in my mind, I'm not discussing the respective merits of democracy vis-a-vis -vis authoritarianism, despotism. I'm discussing the relative weight of Western culture by opposition to Asian culture. And this is something which Russia should ponder. Because Russia can say, I choose the authoritarian model over the democratic model. But is Russia choosing, choosing to be in Asia or remaining in Europe? And it's not for you to choose. It's for the others to perceive where you are. And from that standpoint, it doesn't matter whether you are authoritarian or democratic. The truth is in the eyes of the others. And I can tell you, for having been regularly to Beijing, that they see you as Westerners. And they see you, they look down upon you. I think they are declining demographically. Oh, would they dare compare themselves to us? We are a re-emerging great power. Up till the end of the 18th century, up till the beginning of the 19th century, China was the number one power in the world. 
1815, the number one manufacturing country in the world, was not Great Britain. Sorry, Shirley. It was China. And uh, I remember uh, vividly uh, a painting in the Jesuitic style I saw in the Royal Academy in London. It, w it showed uh, all the envoys of Europe and Asia queuing to pay tribute, to pay respect to the Emperor of China. And the explicit message of that exhibit was Yesterday you paid tribute to us. Tomorrow you will again pay tribute to us. And this is a very deep evolution. If you take demographic terms, economic terms, you realize how oh, the world has changed. At the beginning of the 18th century, Europe, including the Russia of Peter the Great, represented 20% of world population. Today, Europe, including Russia of Putin, represents 6% of world population. The West at large, 10% of world population. Africa represented 150 million people in 1945. Africa will be 2 billion, 200 million in 250. One quarter of humanity. And in Africa and in the Middle East, 50% of the population are below 30. It's not only in the number, it's the age. When it comes to the economy, Europe represented 33% of world wealth in 1815. Today, in 2018, it's the West at large that represents slightly less than 30% of world wealth. In pure quantitative terms, China will be number one economy by the end of this year. And by the end of 2019-2020, uh, India will be the number one country in demographic terms, followed by China, followed by Nigeria. This is the reality of the world we live in. And I think this process of history has been, of course, accelerated by the West itself. We've showed our weaknesses in economic terms with the subprime crisis of 2008, 2007, 2008, which allowed the Chinese to say, well, if you rule the world like that, we are better. I remember uh, a joke told me by the National Security Advisor of Taiwan. Very revealing story. He said, well, in Chinese history, there are three key dates in recent time. In 1949, communism saved, no, sorry, in 1949, communism saved China. He was playing against himself. In 1979, capitalism saved China. And in 2009, China saved capitalism. And it was a joke, but a very serious joke, the kind of which uh, translate the evolution of mentalities. Then, of course, it's not only that the West has betrayed capitalism, but the West has betrayed democracy. The fact that Donald Trump 
has become president of the United States it may be an accident which some Russian may have, may have helped to happen uh, with uh, some influence uh, on the internet and other kind of things. But it was an accident bound to happen. Uh, it was the peak of the crisis of American democracy, of the dysfunctioning of American democracy, of what had become, according to the words of the American philosopher from Japanese origins, Francis Fukuyama, the triumph of vetocracy over democracy. And this is where we are today, at a moment where history is shifting from the beginning of the 16th century on, from the end of the 18th century, the West had progressively come to dominate the world and to consider that it was its role, natural role, to dominate the world. It is no longer the case. And the dual message which we have to take from that is a message of modesty and ambition. Modesty because we have to derive the lessons from our arrogance. We have to realize that we are no longer the center of the world. But ambition because we must strive for what we represented and what we can still represent, i.e. a more human form of capitalism in Europe, i.e. civilization that really do care for human rights, for tolerance and respect for the others. And this combination of modesty and ambition should give us confidence. Confidence to be what we are and to believe in what we are. The second major factor which is taking place in front of our eyes beyond that tectonic geopolitical shift which I describe is what I would call the implosion of one continent, i.e. the Middle East. What we are witnessing is the implosion of the Middle East. The boundaries which we, Shirley and myself, the British and the French, have drawn in 1916 are being rejected, transformed. Countries like Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen no longer exist. They are divided amongst themselves. And what you are witnessing in the Middle East is a combination of the rise of three key words. The first one is fragmentation, which I just described. The second one is radicalization. And the third one is expansion. There is a radicalization in the Middle East. And today, what we are witnessing is something that appears more clearly than yesterday. We have two kind of alliances shaping the history of the Middle East around themselves. The first alliance in between is between Iran, Russia, and Turkey. The second alliance is between Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Israel. 
there is an objective alliance between the Hebrew state and the Sunni states that are Saudi Arabia and Egypt. It looks strange from the outside, but they have a common enemy, which is Iran, which is obsessing them. Within that framework, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, though it is not resolved at all, though it will continue to haunt the region and the world, has disappeared from the strategic agenda. Remember having dinner with the Saudi foreign minister a few months ago in Paris. And I asked them, but what about Israel? And he said, well, Israel is not a threat to Saudi Arabia. We, it's not present in our geopolitical vision of the region. Beyond the opposition between Shi'i Iran and Sunni Islam behind Saudi Arabia, there is, of course, the issue of the rise of terrorism. A terrorism that is striking at our respective countries, be it in Moscow, in London, in Paris, in the United States, wherever. And as you know, there's a major interrogation as to the sources of that terrorism that is expanding on our territories. Are we witnessing, above all, the result of a radicalization of Islam, a Salafization of the Muslim world, or are we witnessing an Islamization of the radicals? To understand what's happening in Moscow, in Paris, in London, is it important to understand Islam, or is it more important to understand movements like the nihilist in the late 19th century, who needed to kill in order to feel that they existed. I destroy you, therefore I exist. And you see in the jails of uh, uh, the Western world, uh, people preaching hatred to those who are lost, who don't know what their identity are. And of course, what is fundamental for us is not to confuse those radicals with Islam at large. I still believe that there is a moderate Islam which we have to extend our hands to. And that nothing would be more dangerous than to simplify and to give a caricatural vision of things. But the fact that a region has imploded at the very moment we were witnessing that kind of geopolitical shift has given a country a unique opportunity to return as a key geopolitical actor in the world. And that is, of course, Russia. And this is my third geopolitical consideration. Russia has made a difference. Russia has won the day in Syria, together, of course, with Iran. And historians of the 21st century will debate about whether Russia won or the West lost. But what, what 
it's insignificant in the end. What is important for us is to compare the Spanish Civil War in the 20th century with the Syrian War. The same causes have brought about the same consequences. In the Spanish Civil War, there were two countries, Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy, backing with the utmost clarity the rebellion led by General Franco. And on the other side, there was the West plus the Soviet Union backing the Republic. But as far as the West was concerned, great uncertainties, great hesitations. Should we support a Republic legal but backed by the Soviet Union and supporting the ideals of uh, communism, anarchism, and in fact just replace Germany and Italy by Russia and Iran, you have the Syrian situation. You have two countries that have no hesitation, no second thoughts. We are for the Bashar al-Assad regime, for reasons that are different, but that are clear. And a Western world as divided, as inefficient as democracies were in the 1930s. Yes, we don't like Bashar al-Assad, but should we support an opposition that contains within it very radical Islam? And by allowing time to proceed, we abandon the small window of hope that may have existed at the very beginning of the Syrian civil war. But Russia is back with a vengeance in the Middle East because the United States have opened a huge door for them. In September 2013, Barack Obama had refused to follow his red line, which he had set for himself and the world. If the regime of Bashar al-Assad uses chemical weapons against its own civil society, we will intervene. And Barack Obama did not intervene. And I think the British played a major role in his decision not to intervene when there was a vote in the British Parliament to say, well, there might have been a chemical attack, but the risk of joining into that war are more important than the risk of violating the principles we have set for ourselves. Here again, let history be judged. I think, and I speak like a Western European, we have to integrate the fact that Russia did succeed in the Middle East in its daring risk-taking. You took risks too. You sent troops, you had casualties, and you won. What the meaning of victory will be is another story. But what lessons are you going to derive as Russians from that victory in the Middle East? Should you go further in Eastern Europe? Should we in the West recognize that Russia has a right to Finlandize Ukraine after taking directly Crimea. This is where I remember 
vividly a moment I experienced in Golitsino, in the Moscow School for Political Studies, at the end of the 1990s. I was defending the Western position in the Balkan Wars and even defending the American intervention over Belgrade. And I remember I felt quite lonely that day. Uh, I was alone uh, with uh, an entire class of the Moscow School uh, uh, who did not accept what I was saying when I was uh, condemning the Milosevic regime and the human rights violation that had been committed with its assent, if not directly, under its name. And my own speech today to Russia would be the following. I've learned from the 1990s. I understand your emotions. I integrate them. I integrate them into my own thinking. They are important for my decision making. You are an actor, not a passive one. But you have to fix limits to yourselves for your own good as much as for the good of the international system. You cannot violate the rules by a combination of deceit and force and take it for granted that we will accept that. And you cannot intervene in our electoral processes the way you are doing. Uh, we know what you are doing. We know that you intervene in the Brexit referendum. We've seen you intervening in the referendum in Catalonia. We, you are playing the card of weakening the European Union, of weakening the cause of democracy, of weakening stability wherever you can. Well, maybe it's a dangerous game. You played clearly against Hillary Clinton in the United States. Are you so happy to have in front of you now the most unpredictable president in the history of the United States? Is it really what you wanted? And sometimes you get it wrong, deeply wrong. You supported Marine Le Pen in the French electoral contest. You lost. You have a president who is his rival, and you have to face him. And, and so my speech would be to say, well, I've learned from my combination of arrogance and illusion. You're not going to become a democracy in the foreseeable future. And I accept what you are and what your priorities are. But in your own interest, are you playing the right card by aligning yourself totally with the authoritarian, despotic regime of the world? Isn't your future lying with the West and not with the East? And in that framework, I come to my fourth factor, which is, of course, Europe. Where are we going? I will not spend a lot of time on Brexit because Calypso will tell you everything you always wanted to know about Brexit and probably a little more uh, this afternoon. But I will tell you of, about Europe in global terms. And the history is totally open. There are two key figures incarnating two completely different futures for Europe. The first figure is Viktor Orban in Budapest, in Hungary, 
and the second figure is Emmanuel Macron in France. Will Europe go the way of Viktor Orban or the way of Emmanuel Macron? And honestly, I do not know the answer. But I deeply believe history is not written yet. There are people who believe already that we are in a post-European history, after Europe. That what's happening in Eastern Europe will prevail in Western Europe. In other terms, that the unification of Europe will not come the way we in the West believed it would take place in the 1990s, i.e. democracy, respect for others, tolerance, openness will prevail, but that nationalism, fixation with identities, and pessimistic vision of the future will prevail. History will not move from west to east, but from east to west. And those who believe in that have some good arguments. They say, look at Europe. It's completely divided. In a division north-south in economic terms. There is the north that succeeds behind Germany, and there is the south that fails behind Greece. And there's no way those two Europe will ever come together. And in value terms, there is a division east-west, with Poland, the leading country in Eastern and Central Europe, having joined recently the uh, uh, group behind Orban Europe. But Hungary, Poland, uh, Poland has joined Hungary. And um, <coughs> what I'm saying is that history is open. That the victory of Macron in France, the re-election of Angela Merkel in Germany, which will take place. I mean, she will be the head of the government, if not in a few days, at least in a few weeks, show that there is something like resilience in uh, uh, those who have a positive vision of Europe. And one of the key reasons why Europe may be resilient is that Macron comes to power at a time when the United States are incarnated by Donald Trump. And he is, so to speak, the, not only the symbol, but the key actor for uh, this vision of a Western liberal capitalistic model still possessed with values, still convinced that there is a future for European integration. And the problem is not to accept passively the fact that we have lost Europeans, but to try to reconquer them actively, positively, by the example by showing them that it's not only the return of economic growth, but the return of democracy with a positive content. And this is where my key words, confidence, ambition, and modesty, are coming back. I've spoken nearly one hour and probably more. Uh, I think the rule of the game was that there should be a debate uh, between ourselves as much as possible.